It's four simple words that say everything about the relationship I have with you and what you have with my daughters. As we've grown together, you've given my girls an example to live by, and that's made me a better mom. I'm so proud of who you've become, and no matter where life leads you, remember these four words. I'd like to welcome everyone at Four Rivers Church in Edible, in Calvert City, and in Paducah. We are having such a wonderful, wonderful time together. So if you would, no matter where you are or what campus you are, would you just join in and celebrating for just a moment with kind of an applause of excitement about all that God is doing? Welcome. I, I know that... I know that in the church we have, uh, we have some folks who work at Comcast, so I apologize before I tell this DirecTV story, okay? But have you seen the commercial on DirecTV about, uh, about how they'll start with one thing, like don't do this, and then it leads to this, and then it leads to this, and then it leads to this? My favorite one... My favorite one is about not having an anger problem, because if you have an anger problem, your schedule clears up, and if your schedule clears up, then you grow a scraggly beard, and if you grow a sc scraggly beard, you'll start picking up stray animals, and then if you pick up stray animals, you'll pick up more stray animals, and you see this guy that looks like Father Time in December, you know, and, and he's, surrounded, he's surrounded by all of these cats and dogs, and you can just tell that his house smells like a litter box, you know, and, and, and you've got that. Well, here's the deal. That's how my brain works. I know that you might be thinking, we always knew you were weird. I don't mean the, the scraggly beard way. I mean, my brain works like I, I kind of sometimes see the first step in a process, and then all of a sudden I go second step, third step, fourth step, fifth step. I kind of feel like that I know where this seventh step's going to be, you know, based upon this first choice. And so one of the things that, that is bad about that is that I sometimes overly stress about the wrong things. You know what I mean? Like, like Brad, which, which milk do you want to buy? You want to buy the brand name milk or the off-brand milk? And I'm going, how is that going to affect my children's uh, bone structure when they're in their 70s? You know what I mean? Like that kind of thing sometimes jumps in. Uh, uh, tonight we're going to talk about parenting and how mentoring, which is all a part of this series, I Believe in You, affects our children. I don't know if you know this or not, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 30% of our congregation is in elementary school, okay? We, very, very young. I mean, literally, like kids everywhere. I mean, I don't know everything about the people of Four Rivers, but I know this, they know how to reproduce. You know what I mean? I, they know how to do that. They, they procreate, that kind of, there are children everywhere. You have them all over the place. And, and we like that. God said, go, you know, therefore, and, and populate the earth and all that stuff. That's a good thing, okay? But we have kids everywhere. Now, at the same time, tonight, uh, today we're going to just be blunt about this. There's a big difference in knowing how to make a baby and knowing how to raise a baby, right? Those are completely different realities. And one of them is much more challenging, and much more difficult and requires a lot more effort than the other. The Bible gives us so many things to give us guidance and direction and help us understand the value of imparting spiritual wisdom and guidance and love and strength into those who God has blessed us with as children. And as a church, if we desire to do this right, if we desire to do something that matters in 10 years or 20 years or 40 years or 100 years, if we want to do something that matters, then we cannot escape the responsibility of raising our children. We cannot escape the responsibility of being a mom or being a dad or even beyond that, being moms and dads to kids who don't have moms and dads or being, you know, big brothers, big sisters, uncles, aunts, that kind of thing, investing in the lives of those who need us. The scripture says this. In Matthew 16, 26, Jesus says, What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world? What does it say? Yet forfeits his soul. I read this passage to you today because I want you to, to just for a moment, I want you to think about what it is that we try to pass on to those who are younger than us. What do we try to pass on to them? I mean, there are lots of things that we might want to teach kids, right? There are lots of things that I might want to teach people who are younger than me. Um, 
You know, but, but this one passage should tell us something that is of most importance. It's at the highest level. If you're going to impart something and give something to the next generation, it should be this awareness of eternity, you know? Uh, but I think, don't you, I think that sometimes in the world in which we live, uh, the value or what seems to be most important when raising children has shifted. Like, for instance, I would say that culture in which we live right now, even people we might look at and say, man, those are good parents right there. That's like the best of parents. They might say culture says that success in parenting is raising well-rounded, well-educated, happy kids. Doesn't that sound nice? Like well-rounded, well-educated, happy kids. Let's say those three things if you guys don't mind all together. Well-rounded, well-educated, happy kids. Uh, well, listen, Calvary City, Nettleville, and Paducah, uh, there are, there's nothing wrong with well-rounded, well-educated, and happy kids. But if that becomes our primary and only goal, I wonder if we might need to go back to Matthew and read that passage again. So what does it value a man if he gains the entire world, yet forfeits his soul. And the temptation, I think, that we might have even as good parents, parents who care, even the best parents among us, I think we fall into this trap sometimes of wanting to give our kids the whole world. Man, if, if we can train them and teach them and empower them and gift them so that they gain the whole world, I want you to have the whole world. I want to give you the whole world. I want to teach you the things so that you can have the whole world. I want you to be well-rounded, well-educated, and happy. But our own holy book, our own scripture, our own Savior says to us, it's not much good for a man to gain the whole world if, if in the process he forfeits his soul. Today my goal is to help us stop trying to raise simply well-rounded, well-educated, healthy, happy children. Now you're thinking, you are strange. Instead, I would suggest that we are called as moms and dads and uncles and aunts and grandparents and and people who invest in the lives of children, I would suggest to you that we are called to unleash single-minded, Christ-centered, biblically-anchored world changers. That's who we're called to raise. That is who we are called to raise. Single-minded, un we are to unleash single-minded, Christ-centered, biblically-anchored world changers. Am I making sense? Psalm 71, 18 says this, even when I am old and gray, this is King David speaking, he says, even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare, listen, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. That's Psalm 71, 18. Church, listen to me. It's not enough. It is not enough to love our children enough to hope they're happy. It is not enough to raise our children to where they know what they want to do with their life. It's not enough to simply provide for them safety, security, and education, even though those things all sound so nice. God is calling us. He is sending us. He is charging us with the challenge of raising up a Christ-centered generation who values the Scriptures as their guide, and Jesus as their Lord, and the world the world as their missional target, who don't simply help someone if they can, but sees their goal in life of making this world better. See the difference? Here's what I mean, and you've heard me say this before, but so often I catch myself with my two sons praying for their safety. I know that all the time. People call me, say, Brad, will you pray for my son that he would be safe, that he's going on a mission trip. Let's pray that he be safe. He's, he's talking to a buddy of his at, at school about Jesus. Pray that he be safe. We want them safe, right? We want them safe. But God doesn't want them safe. God wants them dangerous. You see, dangerous to the one who would stand against them, dangerous to the enemy of this world. Listen to me for just a second, moms and dads, and those of us who can invest in the lives of children. 
We have in our homes with us, not just the church of the future, but we have in our, in our homes right now with us, those that are four and eight and 12 and 18 and 21 and in the world we live in sometimes 27, you know, and, and still right there. We have in our homes with us those not just that hopefully one day God might grow up and use, but I'm telling you, we have in our homes with us the people that God would love to use right now to change his world. We don't need to be just simply focusing on hoping that they're well-rounded, educated, and happy. Listen to me. Listen to me. I hope you hear my, my plea. There will be a lot of people who are well-rounded and educated and happy, and on the surface, everything looks so good. But at the heart, at the core of who they are, they will have forfeited their soul to get there. And you do not want that to be your daughter. You do not want that to be your son. You do not want to be fooled by what on the outside looks to be good things, but on the inside, on the inside is brokenness. On the inside is distance from God. On the inside is emptiness. So we should raise our children. We should raise our children to be Christ-centered. Do you know, you know something? If you tell your three-year-old that the most important thing in the world is Jesus, that's awesome. But did you know when they're four and they're five, they're going to be watching to see whether or not the most important thing in your world is Jesus? You see what I'm saying? Man, our children don't just grow up to believe the things we tell them. They grow up watching the things that we do in front of them. They notice and see and measure what we really believe and who we really are. The Hebrew people were the best at this, you guys. I mean, they are fantastic at making sure that when they raise a young boy or a young girl, that they turn them into a man or a woman of God. They're, they're wonderful at this. In fact, in the Hebrew structure, uh, when you're 12 years old, you've memorized the first five books of the Bible in their original language. So memorized, right? Uh, we have a lot of hard times sometimes raising our kids to know where the first five books of the Bible are, okay? Just being honest, okay? first five books of the Bible are. That's funny. You should laugh at that. Uh, one of the things that uh, to Hebrew people is very important is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. It's called the Shema, S-H-E-M-A, and this is a very valuable passage. L let me read it to you. Just think how this, how this impressed upon them how to parent children and how God might use it to impress upon us. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. You've heard this before, haven't you? Jesus quotes this in the New Testament. He's quoting a verse that most likely his mom taught him, you know, when he was young and memorizing the first five books of the Bible, okay? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts, and then in verse 7, he says, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Imparting spiritual life giving the gift of a connection to Christ, helping someone know how to frame their life around love for God. This is something that you give to someone, something that you're intentional about. And mark my words, it's something that most likely will not happen if you don't intentionally help it happen in the lives of your children. So my goal today is to give you three very simple things just, just to think about in your own family and in your own, in your own life. And if you're here and you're like, I don't have kids, let me just ask that you would consider this. Uh, one, uh, it might very well be that you, ha you don't have kids yet, okay? So, so really, really let this sink in and God might help you become an even better parent before you're a parent, okay? It might be that you're here and you're thinking, I have kids but I'm not as connected or involved in their lives. Maybe they live in another place. Okay, or maybe they're teenagers now and they don't listen to anything I ever say. I understand that, okay? Uh, but think about this and let God teach you. It might be that you say, I'm in my 60s, my kids are grown, and listen, this might mean that you have grandkids or nieces or nephews, people who you can impart spiritual life to, and this, this passage, this teaching is gonna be helpful to us, okay? So three very practical things. The first one is this. 
I'm going to suggest by this passage of Scripture that we start learning how to enlist supporting voices. Enlist supporting voices. It's the nuttiest thing in the world, you guys. Uh, I have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old talk about them a lot. At this point in their life, when I say something, for the most part, they still think it's true. You know, like when dad says it, kind of that settles it, you know. I believe it, dad said it. You know, it's that, that's still kind of there. But I can tell the difference even between the nine-year-old and the six-year-old that, that I think I could tell my six-year-old, daddy can fly. You've never seen me fly before, but I can fly. And I think he would go to his class and go, my daddy can fly. I'm telling you, my daddy can fly. When I was a kid in first grade, this is hilarious. When I was a kid in first grade, uh, I misunderstood something that my dad said. There were some baseball players in the Paducah area in that time whose last name was Ruth. Okay, and my dad was an umpire in high school, and he knew a guy whose last name was Ruth, who was a baseball player, who ended up uh, playing on a baseball team in Louisville, and we went and saw this guy play baseball. I went to my school in first grade and told everyone that my dad was personal good friends with Babe Ruth. I was convinced totally and completely sold out. I remember there being a petition that went around my first grade class that was a question, Dear Mr. Henson, do you really know Babe Ruth? And I had to take it home and get my dad to sign it to prove to my friends, and it completely and totally broke my heart when I showed it to him, and he just laughed at me, you know? I think you missed it there, Brad. I think you missed it. But there comes a time, doesn't there, when the, the nine-year-old doesn't believe in you quite as much as the six-year-old did, and then they're 11, and then they're 14, and all of a sudden, mama went from knowing everything to knowing nothing. Am I right? Listen to me. If you have not intentionally helped other people have a voice in your children's life at that time, you will miss out on a great opportunity to speak life into your children, not just from you, but from the other people that you have helped them learn to listen to and learn to believe He starts out the passage here, the Shema, by saying, Hear, O Israel. Uh, David is not speaking to one person. He's not calling for a plea from one family. He's speaking to everyone. If he were speaking to our church, he would be saying, Look, it's going to take all of us to raise these kids. It's going to take all of us caring about and showing love for and supporting parenting in our life. It's going to take all of us in some way or another to impart spiritual life in the lives of the children of our church and to to change this generation for the good. It's going to take all of us. Enlist supporting voices. In my life, uh, I grew up in a church that had the traditional setting like pastor, associate pastor, youth pastor, worship pastor, you know, know, take out the trash pastor, uh, you know, clean the parking lot pastor. You know, we had all these different ones. And, and there were two of those pastors, a guy who was called the activities pastor, which I think sounds like the coolest job on the planet. His job was to play games with kids. That's what he did all the time. Uh, his name was Stan. And then there was the youth pastor. His name was Mike. Th- these are the two men who at an early age in my life became the voices in me. And the truth is when I was 16 or 17 and I felt God calling me into something special and big, something that I was unsure of, uh, believe it or not, as much as I love my mom and dad and as highly as I speak of them on a regular basis, they will see this video. I mean, as, as much as I care about them, when I felt God tugging at my heart, calling me into ministry, they are not the first people I went to. I went to my youth pastor and then I went to the activities pastor and I talked to them and told them, I think I think this is what God's calling me to do. And those voices who my parents had helped invest in me, who had told me, you can listen to these people, you can trust these people, those men spoke truth into me that I then got to go and share with my mom and dad. Am I making sense here? Parents, listen to me. I know that this little girl is your daughter. I know that this boy is your son. I know that. I know nobody else gets to be her mom. Nobody else gets to be your dad. And I know that it's really tempting and very easy to wrap your arms around them metaphorically and not let anybody else speak to them and not let anybody else invest in them and not let anybody else care for them. But the truth is you need their River Kids teachers to tell them about Jesus. You need their small group leaders to tell them about Jesus. You need the people in your group to tell them about Jesus. Let me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Your teenager's 14 years old and you're getting on to him or her for running around the wrong crowd and you're telling them it's a great value to walk with kids who love Jesus, right? But then they know that you've been invited to be a part of a river group every Sunday for the last two years and you're still not doing it. 
You're still not letting other people speak into your life. You're still not sharing your faith with other adults. You're still not surrounding yourself with men and women of God who can help you. Listen to me, am I, am I, am I getting across here? It's one thing to tell your kids something. It's another to model it for them and show them Hanging around the right people matters. Spending your life with the right people matters. Listening to the right voices matters. Trusting the choices in your life to the right counselors matters. So not only tell them to do it, but show them how to do it and put in their lives men and women of God by getting together with other men and women who love God regularly, all the time, having them in your house and you're in theirs. Am I making sense? When your daughter decides to talk to to another woman about whether or not she's going to uh, spend the night with her boyfriend when she's 15. You want to make sure that the woman she's talking to is the kind of woman who's going to give the advice that you want given, right? So you have to make sure that you are intentional about allowing other voices to invest into your children. The second thing is this, and I, actually I should say this for just a moment. Uh, for the last six months or so, we've talked as a church about eventually investing much more in youth ministry and, and hiring some staff for that. And we need to do it, guys. We need to do it. We need to organize and plan a team of people who will help us raise our teens and who will help us go after teens whose parents aren't raising them and who will help us care for, for teens who don't have anybody in their life. And ultimately, it really comes down to this. I'm just going to be blunt as can be. Calvert, Edible, Paducah, this is it. We need to be able to afford it, okay? And, and I'm asking you to help us do this. Help us know how to do this. Help. We, we got the right people. We're ready to do it. We need to be able to afford it. And we're going to hire and find people that you can trust to become supporting voices to helping raise your, your kids. The second thing is this. Raise the expectations. The Lord says in Deuteronomy 6.5, this is the second part of the Shema. Love the Lord your God with part of your heart, some of your soul, and a bit of your strength. No. No, that's not what it says at all, is it? That's not what he says. He says, love the Lord your God with, read it with me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. In 1 Corinthians 13, 11, Paul says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And then I became a what? Man. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. You know, there's a new word going around. It's called chadult. You like that word? Chadult. I don't like it at all. I think it describes something that should not exist. A chadult. You know what a chadult is? 27-year-old with the brain of an 11-year-old. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? A body of an adult, attitude of a kid. That's a chadult, okay? Uh, here's the problem. As parents, I'm speaking from my own heart, and I know I told our other leaders here I'm a little scared of this sermon because it, it, it feels like I'm meddling just a little bit. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm, here's, here's what I'm saying, okay? I think that as a culture, we raise our kids to stay young. We want them to be our babies for a long, long time. We get, I'm gonna, this is gonna hit hard, okay? But listen, we have issues as adults that feel better when we have people who depend on us and need us. And, and we want our babies to stay our babies for a long, long time. And I've made the jokes in the past about John Cougar Mellencamp and all the evil of, you know, hold on to 16 as long as you can. You know, changes come around recently and make us women and men. You know, I, I'm, that's a joke, of course. But the issue is this. Listen, everywhere else in the world except for America, you're either a child or an adult. You are a child, treated like a child, loved like a child, cared for, supported, protected as a child, and there comes a time in your life when you step across a line. And when you step across that line, you're an adult, and you're responsible for your own decisions, and you're responsible for your own choices. When we look back on our great-grandparents and our great-grandparents, and we look at our family tree, and we go, my great-great-grandmother was married at 13. You see, we think with our own mind, we think, she must have been a messed up 13-year-old. No, you know what she was? She was an adult at 13, ready to get married, buy a farm, milk a cow, raise kids. See what I'm saying? At 13. You know what we're good at at 13? <laughs> Sometimes video games. That's it, you know? That's it. And so here's the deal. I don't blame this on kids. I don't think this, I don't think we can point fingers at teenagers. I love teenagers. If you're a teenager listening to me right now, this is not a pick on teenagers topic. This is a parent problem. Okay, 
This is a parent problem. The parent problem is this. Men and women, we have to raise our little boys to be men. We have to raise our little girls to be women. We have to raise them to make choices and stand by their choices and and love God with all their heart, be sold out to who they are, be single-minded, biblical-focused, and serious about their faith. We have to raise them to love God with all of their heart and all of their soul and all of their strength and all of who they are. And we won't get that by trying to make sure they stay our little baby. We won't get that. Listen to me. I sound, I sound like, like the old mean preacher who's on the AM station yelling. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't mean that. I hope you don't hear me in that tone. My tone is this. I want your boys and your girls to love Jesus and to love their families and to, and to care for the, those who are responsible, they're responsible for in their life. And I want when you're in your 50s or 60s or 70s to look into your children's life and be proud of what you raised. Okay? And the scripture tells us how to do it. But when we don't do it that way, when we don't model in their life, they don't become the people that God has told us they can be. And then we get to be 50 or 60 or 70 and we're not proud of what we raised. Okay? So this is a helpful biblical warning about raising the expectations. Raising the expectations in your family, in your home, and in the lives of your children Raising the expectations so that you are expecting your little boys to be men of God. You're expecting your little girls to be women of God. You're expecting all of us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Now, Calvert City, Edible, and Paducah, let's all go to the third point, if you would. The last thing I'll say to you is this. Keep it real. The Shema says this, impress them on your children. This is the same Deuteronomy 6 passage, okay? Impress them on your children. Now, he's going to tell you how to do that. This is how you keep it real. This is how you impress these things on your children. It says, talk about them when you sit at home or when you walk along the road. Do you know what that means? All the time. Talk about them all the time. Spend your life looking for opportunities to share the love of God with your kids. All the time. Spend your time doing that. Secondly, It says, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, this gives us instructions. We ought to be talking to our kids about Jesus when we put them to bed at night, spending time with them, praying with them. And when they get up in the morning, you know what the most important thing happens in their day in the first five minutes? Is we're talking to them about this day, what today God's going to do in their life. You're thinking, this sounds like a lot of hard work to me. And I'm telling you, right on. It's a lot of hard work to love your children into a relationship with Jesus and to raise the bar and to keep it real in your life. The scripture goes on to say this, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Now, Hasidic Jews are real liberal about, I mean, literal about this. Like they have boxes, you know, not not making fun of that. I don't really think that's what the intention here is. The intention is make this so visible in your life that it is obvious to your children that this is who you are, okay? It says, write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates, In other words, we are going to put this so much in front of our kids that they see it anywhere and everywhere all the time. And now you're thinking, listen, I I know when I've said this before, there's a little pushback, and and it's a fair pushback, so let me toss this out. Brad, I'm afraid if I push my spirituality down my kid's throat that they're going to rebel against it, okay? All across, how many of you would say that's a fair thing? I'm a little concerned about that, right? Okay, Uh, we have have folks, I think, at each campus. Let me just be raw and honest with you, okay? If you outwardly and on Sundays push your church attendance and your persona of Christianity on your kids and you push it and push it and push it but then you go home and on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday you live life in a completely different way so that your kids know the real you and the Jesus you you know what I mean your kids know the real you and the church you your kids know the opinionated bible guy you and the guy who mistreats his their mama you you know, if, they, if your kid knows the, the, the one who in Sunday school acts like he's all about Jesus, but at home acts like he doesn't care about his kids at all, you, let me tell you something. It's not you're pushing your religion down their face that pushes them away. It's your hypocrisy that pushes them away. Men and women, listen to me. There is nobody in our lives that knows us better than our children. They are watching when we don't know they're watching. They are seeing things when we don't know they are seeing things. The other day, the other day, one of my kids got mad, kicked something, and said, not a real bad word, not like a like bad, bad word, but, you know, 
uh, PG-13 word. Kicked it. And I wanted to go, where have you heard that? And then I remembered. (laughs) Okay? Listen, all I'm saying is our children are wired to notice us, watch us, and mimic us. But when the integrity we have handed our kids questions the integrity that they see in our lives, it pushes them away from God. And rightly so, or at least rightly so that it pushes them away from our kind of God. If you want to be serious about showing your faith to your kids, make sure that the faith you're showing is one of genuine authenticity. You want to show your love to them? Don't show them what you do outwardly to make people think you're Christian. Show them who you are inwardly because you are Christian. This is about being real. This is about being serious. We have to keep it real. Psalm 71, 18 again, David says this. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare the power to the next generation. I want to show your might to all who are to come. Four Rivers Church, I don't know another church in our region that has the percentage of kids to adults that we have. I don't know another one. We need to impart Christ following into their lives. Men, we need to teach boys how to be men. Women, we need to teach girls how to be ladies. Adults, we need to teach children how to be adults in Christ. That means, I'm just say it straight up, that means that our faith is going to be genuine and authentic, and we're going to model a whole heart, whole soul, whole spirit, love of God in the way that we live and who we are. We're going to model that. We're going to help one another. When we see one another out of that line, we're going to lovingly suggest wholeheartedness in our faith, right? We're going to hold one another accountable to that. But in addition to that, we're going to staff our children's ministries like crazy. We're all going to jump up and go, where do I sign up? How do I help? Because I want to help do this. We're going to staff our youth ministries so well. We're going to say, how do I get involved? I want to change the life of a teenager. You see what I'm saying? We're going to give to this so that we know that we are pulling off anything and everything we need to pull off. And in the long run, you guys, in the long run, we are going to raise an army of Christ followers who love Jesus and are dangerous to the enemy in this city. Are you with me? Let's pray together.